Hello everyone, in this video I'll talk about TRIS, LAT and PORT registers which are used to control the I.O. capabilities of the PIC microcontrollers. They are straightforward but some parts may be a bit tricky and there are some traps you can fall into as well which I'll of course talk about. So let's get started. For those who don't know, I.O. stands for Input Output, so the topic of this video is changing or reading the states of the pins of the microcontroller. Before diving deeper, I'll first explain it in short. You mainly have three registers to worry about, which are TRIS, LAT and PORT registers. But there are two more important registers that you should know about as well. These are MCEL and WPU registers. Every pin has their corresponding TRIS, LAT and PORT bits that configure their corresponding options. But not every pin will have a corresponding NCEL or WPU bits, and we'll get to why that is so in a bit. Bits in the TRIS registers, so TRIS bits, will make their corresponding pins input or output. Putting 1 in a TRIS bit will make their corresponding pin input, while putting 0 there makes it output. Bits in the LAT registers, so LAT bits, will make their corresponding pins as output connect to either VDD or VSS, so it configures the output state of the pin which also means this bit is only relevant if the pin is configured as output. Putting 1 in a LAT bit will make the corresponding pin connect to VDD, while putting 0 there makes it connect to ground. Bits in the port registers, so port bits, will contain their corresponding pins as current state. So port bits are used to read the state of the input pin, which also means port registers are only relevant when the pin is configured as input. When read, if the input pin is at VDD level, it will return 1 while if the input is at a ground level, it will return 0. Bits in the NCEL registers, so NCEL bits, will make the corresponding pins either analog or digital. Not every pin has analog capability, hence not every pin will have a corresponding NCEL bit. Putting 1 in the NCEL bit will make the corresponding pin analog input, while putting 0 there makes it digital input. Bits in the WPU registers, so WPU bits, will enable or disable the internal pull-up on their corresponding pins. Not every pin has an internal pull-up capability, hence not every pin will have a corresponding WPU bit. Putting 1 in a WPU bit will enable the internal pull-up on the corresponding pin, while putting 0 will disable it. This is the basic explanation for each register. Now, we'll go deeper in and understand how all of this works, and I'll also talk about some traps you may fall into along the way as well. If you look at the pinout of our microcontroller, you can see the names of the pins. We say that these are the names of the pins, but really, they are the names of their corresponding port bits. For example, this is the port A register, which as you can see, contains bits that have the same names as some of the pins. And of course, these bits read the value of their corresponding pin that has the same name. You can see that there are multiple groups of pins. RA, RB, RC, RD, and RE pins make up these groups. These groups are determined by their corresponding register names. These register names go like TRIS A, TRIS B, or LAT A, LAT B, and so on. And of course, there are port A, port B registers, and etc. as well. This is done to differentiate between the registers that has the same name and functionality. If you pay attention, each group will at most have 8 pins, starting from 0 to 7. You can probably guess that this is also because this is an 8-bit microcontroller, so the registers have a length of 8 bits, so each register can only contain bits to configure 8 pins in total. So, for example, the RD6 pin right here is named as such because its corresponding port bit resides in the port D register and in the bit 6's location. This also applies for the other registers. I said that TRIS registers are used to configure a pin as an input or an output, right? The TRIS bit that configures the RD6 pin would also be in the TRIS D register, in the bit 6's location. So to turn this bit into output, we can put 0 to the TRIS D6 bit. As another example, take the RB2 pin. Its corresponding TRIS bit would be TRIS B2, since it's in the B group and in the bit 2's location. From here, you can see that this bit resides in the TRIS B register and in the bit 2's location. So to configure this bit as an input or an output, we can use this bit. The same way, this pin's corresponding LAT and port bits will be in the LAT B and port B registers and in the bit 2's location as well. Here's the diagram for the I.O. circuitry connected to the microcontroller pins. You can try to understand this, but I'll draw my own to make it a little simpler to understand. This diagram isn't particularly bad, but for a beginner who doesn't know the way computers work on silicon level, it probably looks confusing. Before we get into the diagram, there's a gate that I haven't talked about, so let's get that out of the way. You should know that this is a buffer, meaning whatever the input is will be the output, and this is the truth table for it if you remember. But there's a variation of it called tri-state buffer, which has this symbol. 
So for this gate, there is another input which I'll denote as E. The reason this gate is called tri-state is because it has three states, even though you might think that there will be four since we have two inputs. This is the truth table for the tri-state buffer. Again, remember that the x means any value, so this can be 1 or 0, we don't care. And this new term z means that the output y will be in a high impedance state. You'll sometimes see this term written as high z as well. When the output is like this, we can imagine it as if the output is disconnected from the input. So the third pin acts like a switch to enable or disable this gate. When the input is 1, this gate acts just like a normal buffer. But when this input is 0, the output is essentially disconnected from the input, hence why the input doesn't matter here. You'll see why this gate is important in a bit. Let's see the simplified diagram for the I.O. registers. We have three main registers for I.O. Tris, LAT, and port registers. I'll talk about NCEL and WPU registers afterward. This is the simplified diagram for a single bit within those registers, so each of these boxes represent one bit that you can read from or write to. Don't forget that these bits are used to store a 0 or 1 value inside of them. And as you know, this symbol denotes a physical pin. So this is the circuit diagram for a single pin. So for each I.O. pin, there exists this exact circuit with their corresponding bits. And here, you can see the tri-state buffer I talked about, which is the reason why tris registers and bits are named so, since they control this tri-state buffer. I've said that lat bits are used to set the output high or low, and you can see why that is so. If the tri-state buffer is enabled, the output is directly connected to the lat bit. So if the lat bit is 1, the output is 1, and vice versa. And I've said that the tris bits are used to configure a pin input or output. This is because the tris bit can isolate the output from the lat bit by turning the tri-state buffer off, which will make it an input. And you can see that the input here is inverted, which is denoted by this circle. I've said that if the tris bit is 0, the pin will be output. So if the tris bit is 0, this input will be 1 which will enable the tri-state buffer and connect the lat bit to the output, making it an output pin. And the reverse is also true. It's inverted like this to make it so that putting 0 here will make the pin output and putting 1 will make it input instead of the opposite, which makes it easy to remember since the 0 resembles the O in the output and 1 resembles the I in the input. I've said that the port bit is used to read the state of the pin. You can see that if this input is 1, then the output of the end gate will be whatever this input is, which then will be written onto the port bit, which you can read in your code. You will have the question, why do we need this end gate? The reason is that when the pin is configured as analog input, you would want this digital input to be turned off, since the non-digital input would cause access current consumption and noise for no reason on this digital circuit. I won't go into details about it though. I've said that the end cell bit is used to make the input either analog or digital, right? This pin is also secretly connected to the analog input of your microcontroller, but we'll talk about that in another video. So we can use this NCEL bit to disable the digital input for this pin, which will instead enable the analog input. Don't forget that not every pin has analog capability, so all this only applies for the pins that have that capability. Otherwise, for the pins that don't, the input is straight connected to their corresponding port bit, and no corresponding NCEL bit will exist for them. There is also the WPU bit that I didn't show here. This is because not every pin has an internal pull-up. Only the RB pins have this functionality along with RA3 pin. For the pins that have this capability, it's something like this. So if the WPU bit is set, the output will have a resistor connecting it to the VDD rail. But don't forget, it's called a weak pull-up, so the resistor value is quite high. The datasheet doesn't specify the value, but it should be higher than a couple tens of ohms at the very least. Now I'll show you a quick example on how to configure your pins. I'll have the four pins at the bottom left of our microcontroller as inputs, and the four pins at the bottom right of our microcontroller as outputs. Then, I'll read the status of the pins on the left, and I'll put them to the pins on the right in a straight line. Then we can see the states of the outputs using LEDs. Let's first determine which pins should be inputs. RC2, RC3, RD0, and RD1 pins. Now, I know that these pins have multiple functionalities, but by default, all those functionalities should be disabled. Even if there are exceptions, I've yet to come across them. If there are no configuration bits that change their functionalities, like the FOSC bits we've seen before, everything else should be turned off by default, so we can just treat them as I.O. pins by default. Now, we can set the trist bits of these pins to configure them as inputs. 
But remember that if any of these have analog capability, we have to clear their end cell bits so we can use them as digital inputs. Checking the datasheet, we can see that all of them have analog capabilities, so let's clear their corresponding end cell bits. Now, let's determine which pins should be output, RC5, RC4, RD3, and RD2 pins. Let's clear the trist bits of these pins to configure them as outputs. We don't need to worry about their analog capabilities this time, since we'll use them as outputs and not inputs. Now, I'll make an infinite loop so that we can keep executing our program. Inside of it, I'll just read the state of the input pins using their corresponding port bits, and use that value to update the output pins that are straight across them using their corresponding lat bits. We can write it like this, but we're storing these values for no reason, which will consume RAM. A better way to write this would be like this, using the value we read from the inputs to directly update the outputs. Here's the circuit. I just connected a wire from the power rails to the input pins to connect them to high or low voltage, while putting an LED on the output pins to see their status. If they are high, the LED will light up, and if they are low, it won't. We can see that all the LEDs are lit up right now, since all the inputs are connected to the positive rail. If I switch the inputs between 5V and ground, you can see the LEDs across them changing the same way as well, which is exactly what we wanted, so the code is working without a problem. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of these bits and registers. We'll use them a lot more, so you should understand them better over time. I mean, the pins are the only way for a microcontroller to interact with the circuits physically, so they are used in everything. Let's talk about some traps you may run into, as well as some tricks you can use. First things first. It may be obvious, but I'll say it anyways. When you use a pin as an I.O., you won't be able to use their other functionalities at the same time. There are some exceptions, but you won't have to worry about them. Second, if you search the internet about these registers, you may have come across questions like what is the difference between LAT and port registers, or which one should you read from or write to? These questions exist because even though you would think that port registers should be read-only, they can in fact be written onto. Any writes you do to a port bit will be redirected onto the corresponding LAT bit, so writing this is the equivalent to writing this. This has to do with older ways of writing the code. You could directly write RB2 or RD5 and etc. to both read from or write to these bits. We can no longer do this in the newer versions, you'll just get an error. But how about which register to read? Well, if you check the diagram on the datasheet, you'll see that reading the lat bit will return the value of your lat bit, which comes before the tri-state buffer, and reading the port bit will return the value of your pin's current state. So, if you want to read the state of your lat bit, read the lat bit, and if you want to read the state of your actual pin, read the port bit. You may ask, aren't they the same thing if it's configured as output? Well, they should be, but say that your lat bit is 1. But if you have a short circuit on your output, you won't read the same values. You'll read 1 on your last bit, but 0 on your port bit. Now you may ask, if there's a short, the circuit is flawed anyways, right? Well, yes, but it's just safer to read the port bit. Most of the time you won't really have a reason to ever read the lat bits anyways. Sometimes an open drain output may be needed, depending on the application. This is how an open drain output looks like. I won't go into details about why you might want this, but certain applications require it. You'll know when you need it. Some microcontrollers have an option to turn its outputs to open drain, and some microcontrollers have pins that are open drain to begin with. This microcontroller has neither, but you don't actually need them anyways. The circuit you have technically already has open drain capability. There's a way to use your I.O. circuit to mimic an open drain output. If you connect the lat bit to ground, you can instead use your tris bit to connect the output to ground or isolated, which is exactly how an open drain output works. Here, I have a resistor connected to 5V, an LED connected to it. I can pull the other lead of the LED to ground or make it float by switching the corresponding tris bit. Always make sure to check your datasheets properly. For example, 18F4X and 18F2X devices don't have the same pin count, so some of the I.O. registers won't exist in the 18F2X devices. Make sure to read the notes on the datasheet. 
Also, I've said before that MCLR pin can be used as I.O. on this microcontroller, which turns it into RE3 pin. But don't forget, MCLR pins are usually input only, so they don't have corresponding TRIS or LAT bits. But there's a hack you can do on some microcontrollers to make it able to run an LED for example. This may be an option for devices like these, where you only have a couple of pins to begin with. Wasting a pin for blinking a simple LED may not be desirable. If I connect an LED to this pin and connect the other end to ground, I can turn this LED on or off using the internal pull-up like this. The internal pull-up is a high resistor value, so you don't need another resistor from LED to ground. However, since the resistor value is so high, the LED will be quite dim. Lastly, microcontrollers are not designed to supply or sync high power on their pins. In fact, if you look at the datasheet, you can see that this microcontroller is only designed to source or sync 25 milliamps on its pins. So you can't really drive high power components like motors directly from your pins. And obviously, to get around this, you can just connect a more powerful MOSFET and drive it using your pins, and use the MOSFET to drive the high power components. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe, it's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.